Welcome back everyone. This is the State of the Nation. Next month, the latest season of Bash in Sri Lanka for LTT funds will scream in Geneva. As reported many times, many elements are gearing for possibly another resolution against this country. Why? Well, because the LTT loving diaspora money still funds LTTE sympathizing organizations like the UNHRC. So they got to uh, do something to showcase results. The government of Sri Lanka confirmed that they have indeed received the draft report of the UNHRC High Commissioner this time around. Sources close to the Foreign Ministry tells me at this time Sri Lanka is quite happy with the report of the High Commissioner mainly because she has for once accepted the progress made in Sri Lanka in the human rights front and as usual has requested to do this and that. However, has a long way to go as the UNHRC is known to change its tune from time to time. There are three things that the United Nations uh, must do and ad adhere to. One, Sri Lanka is not a state at war like in Afghanistan. We are a nation now at peace. So treating us like a war-torn state after 13 years seems to be a bit redundant and is an absolute joke. Two. If the UN and its body can come up with a relief package worth trillions of dollars for countries like Afghanistan to recover after the war, where exactly are their investments in Sri Lanka? What did they do to help us to develop, especially the UN, after the war? They slapped one resolution after resolution against Sri Lanka and created a false narrative on the world stage, making it difficult for us to even by ourselves find support. Three, stop letting LTTE terrorists lobby in your backyard. We all know many LTTE terrorists after creating fake organizations like the transnational government of Tamil Elam and so forth are funded by terrorists themselves and are freely roaming in Geneva in, at, at the UNHRC. In those sessions, none of those organizations has been vetted or investigated by the UN or the UNHRC. Those LTT funds are making their way into Geneva. The very reason the UNHRC is not investigating prompts us to think, well, has that money been made into the UN's pocket as well. The UNHRC has had double standards for a long period of time. Interestingly, some of this critique had stemmed from countries such as the United States that had withdrawn from the UNHRC during President Trump's tenure, with fierce criticism of the Council's membership. In Cuba, the government continues to arrest and detain critics and human rights advocates. Political prisoners by the thousands continue to sit in Cuban jails. Yet Cuba has never been condemned by the Human Rights Council. The criticism of Cuba by the United States has been quite hypocritical, given that the Guantanamo Bay prison is still active to this date in Cuba. In January 2022, a group of independent human rights experts appointed by the UN Human Rights Council condemned the continued operation of the Guantanamo Bay detention facility in Cuba as a site of unparalleled notoriety and a stain on the US government's commitment to the rule of law. Since the opening of the detention center in 2002, only 12 detainees are reported to have been charged and just two convicted by military commissions. The trial of the five accused of directly participating in the 2001 plot that led to planes being hijacked and flown into New York's Twin Towers and the Pentagon has still not begun. On the 3rd of this month, the United States attacked and killed Islamic State leader Abu Ibrahim al-Hashimi in Syria. In this drone attack, at least 13 civilians, including six children and four women, were also killed. This serves as a very good example of the kind of rash actions the United States of America takes against civilian population in other countries with a certain exceptionalism from accountability. Another commonly quoted example is the slaughtering of Irish civilians by the British Armed Forces in Londonderry 50 years ago, which had undergone no investigation by the UNHRC. The United Kingdom went on to introduce the Overseas Operation Bill to protect United Kingdom soldiers from prosecution for crimes committed abroad after five years. In 2017, the UN Watch had reported that only 14 countries from 193 member nations of the UN had been condemned in the UNHRC. Over 50% of the resolutions passed by the UNHRC has been against one country, which is Israel. Now, several events occurring thousands of miles away is giving us a glimpse of why we as Sri Lankans need to do our best to unify and put out a fight to defeat because what's occurring in Canada is a reminder as to what could happen in the rest of the world for all of us Sri Lankans. 
By now, you are well aware that in the province of Ontario in Canada, a bill was passed in its state parliament called Bill 104, which declares a Tamil Genocide Educational Week. Yep, it's legal in Ontario right now. A week after May 18th, in all schools of the province, children have a curriculum that says Sri Lankans, as you and me, have committed genocide against Tamils living in Sri Lanka during the war. How did these individuals come by this analysis? Where's the data? Where's the declaration at least by a legal entity anywhere in the world which says or attributes to that fact? Zilch, nada. Not one organization, be it the UN, the UNHRC, UN Refugee Council, the ICRC, the Red Cross, any organization. In fact, all fact-finding missions across who came and uh, did their investigations here in Sri Lanka soon after the war ended, all of them have never attributed to anything saying that genocide occurred against the Tamils here in Sri Lanka. Of course, there was a war against the LTTE, a ruthless, abysmal, inhuman gutter excrements of humanity. Now, those losers, yeah, there was a calculated war against those dogs of terrorists who waged a war against innocent Sri Lankans. That occurred, and everyone agrees with that assessment that Sri Lanka fought ruthless terrorists and won. In fact, the drama that's unfolding in Geneva at the UN Human Rights Council, even they do not say that genocide occurred in Sri Lanka. So where's the evidence of genocide in Sri Lanka? The claim is Tamil genocide, but my firm conclusion is somewhere around six to 7,000 at a maximum. My evidence is verified. There was no genocide. My evidence comes from people like the US Ambassador Blake the UN in country team, the census done after the war by the Tamils, the University Chiefs for Human Rights, and many, many others, all of whom confirm six to 7,000. Now, what's happening in Ontario is very prudent to understand. This act, which has been directly enforced since last year, is teaching the children in Ontario province utter misinformed bullshit lies against Sri Lanka. These innocent children who go for education are now caught to a powerful LTTE propaganda machine which is throwing good money to get their bullshit cause ratified and the legislative dumb Ontarians are blindly eating that BS. So who presented this bill? Who led the way to bring in such legislation in Canada? Sometimes you might think it might be a white Canadian dude. Nope. It's a Sri Lankan-born LTTE lover. Let me introduce you to the author of Bill 104, Vijay Thanigasalam, a legislator for Scarborough Rough Park, an uh, electorate in Ontario, much like one of our Grama Seva divisions. How come this brown dude represents that electorate? Well, that's because in this electorate, over 32% are South Asians, meaning Sri Lankan Tamils, living there. This electorate has one individual representing the, uh, representing the Canadian Parliament. He's called Satya Sangari Ananda Sangari. That's a very familiar name, right? Well, it's because he's the son of TULF leader V. Ananda Sangari. He has been very vocal about federalism here in Sri Lanka. So now this electorate has one guy representing the Parliament of Canada pushing towards LTTE ideology in Sri Lanka. The other dude, Vijay Thanagas Dalam, represent the state parliament of Ontario. As you can see, in 2011, Thanagas Dalam so badly missed his beloved leader, the dog of a terrorist, who was killed and eradicated military by our heroic forces. Yes, the same ludicrous human excrements who was involved in ethnic cleansing, human drug trafficking, bombing civilians and using human shields, and using children as soldiers and suicide bombers. Yep, that nincompoop. This legislative member of the Canadian State Parliament misses him so much. So what does he do? He whips up a bill to spew bullshit to young minds. 
The dumb Canadian State Legislative Assembly eats his bowl and passes the legislation, which is now in force since last year as Bill 104. Now, although it's occurring in Canada, thousands and thousands of miles away from Sri Lanka, what we need to understand is when LTTE and its failed leader, Prabhakaran, colossally was unable to achieve his dubious homeland dream and tactfully managed to brainwash the Tamil youth in Sri Lanka to fight for his wealth and cause, and mind you, when his children were having a great time in London, he failed in achieving that separate homeland dream militarily. Now, individuals like Vijay Thanagaslam from Canada, who is an ardent follower of Prabhakaran, is creating another generation after generation of young minds and brainwashing them with the utmost bull on what really happened here in Sri Lanka and trying to create another set of people who would work towards their failed leaders' dreams. In other words, this joker has masterfully fooled the Ontario Canadians to recruit young minds to his terrorist schemes by tactfully embedding these types of teachings through the school curricula. I hope intelligent Canadians, if, if, if there is anything like that, can see through this bill and the bull and will put an end to his shenanigans. With this act, schools are getting funding to educate their children on this terrorist ideology. Is that what Canadians really want? For their tax dollars to educate and create another set of brainwashed, terrorist-loving children? Isn't this bill actually indirectly supporting recruitment of terrorists? Has the parents and teachers wetted this educational process and found the truth by themselves? Or are they being forced by these terror-loving parliamentarians like Tanik Islam to recruit Canadian children for their terror cause? I mean, this is similar to the terror recruitment camps we saw in Afghanistan, right? The only difference is this has been done via the state legislative body, tactfully. No, now what happened was, after 2009, all the Western governments, they have stopped giving refugee status for the Tamil, especially come from Sri Lanka. So then, as example, previous years, uh, data shows us roughly 20,000 Tamils were granted as refugees each and every year during the war period. Last few years, only 619 application has been granted. Now, they had to have another campaign influence the asylum policy. This is a political program carried out by the remnants of the LTTE because they want to carry on bringing refugees into this country because every refugee means 35 to $40,000 per person. And I believe that Bill 104 is merely a means of strengthening their claim. So this is merely a way of keeping their money supply. Well, all is not lost. We Sri Lankans are true survivors. Sri Lankan Canadians in Ontario are fighting back. They've already filed a couple of uh, lawsuits in the Ontario Superior Court asking whether the term genocide can be used in Sri Lanka's fight against terrorism, especially when there is no evidence to base that claim. Sadly, this is not a Sri Lankan government-funded push. Uh, Sri Lankans living in Ontario, Canada, have banded themselves together. They're doing bake sales, they're doing car washes, they're doing various activities and finding the funds by themselves to go after these terror-loving state parliamentarians and their dubious acts. All of you should visit SriLankaCanada.ca to get more information on this fight against these LTT-loving fanatics who's using their money to propagate the utter bull which our heroic soldiers defeated militarily on Sri Lankan soil. Now the LTT lovers are doing their level best to get some support across the world to keep their failed home state dreams alive. Tamil Sri Lankans, mind you, you really need to understand that Tamil Sri Lankans living here have nothing to do with this bill or this bull. They want to live in harmony with everyone. Tamils who are really here are more interested in getting the best for their children, living uh, their best lives, best schools, best roads, development, everything. Everyone else wants is the exact thing that they also are interested in. This separate Tamil homeland bull is kept alive by the existing LTT sympathizing terrorist. I know this firsthand because I'm 50% Tamil. Not one member in my family has ever wanted anything to do with this separate homeland bull. 
Remember, these parliamentarians from Canada is supporting a terrorist ideology. Anyone supporting that should only be viewed as terror supporters and nothing else. In case we fail this fight in Canada to get uh, rid of this nonsense spewed by Canadian state legislators like Tanaka Salam, this crap can slowly seep into other countries like the UK and Australia where there is a large LTT loving diaspora and can gain traction worldwide as well. Well, joining me now uh, to discuss more on the upcoming UNHRC session is Professor Prasubha Mahanamaheva from the Faculty of Law, University of Technology in Jamaica. He was also the former Human Rights Commissioner in Sri Lanka from 2012 to 2015. Uh, thank you very much, for, uh, Professor, for joining me. Professor, here we are, once again, at the cusp of another UNHRC session. We all know that there will not be many positive things about the situation in Sri Lanka, despite our continuous efforts towards human rights. So why do you think but the Human Rights, um, the High Commission, along with the UNHRC, is blind to any progress made. What do they really want? Mahesh, I really endorse your statement because this is the only place where the LTT diaspora and their supporters, international uh, human rights organization, can put the blame for Sri Lanka, criticize Sri Lanka, and to pass a resolution. So all these elements, they get together and collate all their reports. What they do, they submit to UNHRC High Commission Office. So they just believe that. So this is the issue. Now I'll give some example. You have seen very recently, January 22nd, the 20, 2022, the first visit of uh, Mr. Tariq Ahmed, the present state minister in uh, United Kingdom, he gave a very progressive report. He also made his sentiments and also how Sri Lanka is progressing. Many foreign visitors, they visit here, they visit the country, they meet the people, they analyze our day-to-day -day situation and they say we are progressing. Most of the 13 recommendations given against Sri Lanka, now we have implemented or in the process of implementing. So this is not the situation where UNHRC, uh, the five countries as well as Human Rights High Commission Office see. So they want to put the target on the spot because we have withdrawn from 30 slash 1. That's the real reason, Mahesh. Indeed. Uh, Professor, I want to get your attention uh, to the U.S. Uh, now, two years ago, as soon as the Biden administration came to power, one of the first things uh, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, uh, had uh, undertaken was to uh, comment about the accountability process here in Sri Lanka, which resulted in them sponsoring a resolution later on. How do you see America's role uh, this time around, especially with the Ukraine issue still hot on the heels? Will they uh, continue to harass Sri Lanka or do they have more significant issues to deal with? UNHRC never look how United States, the situation, violation of the human rights we have seen in many ways. As well as we have seen in the former president, Trump's government, they have withdrawn from the UNHRC because they are playing a big political role. So this is where when uh, President Honorable Biden came to power, once again they took the membership and also they pressurized. This pressurize is basically Sri Lanka. Why? Whatever the UNHRC methodology, UNHRC system, uh, we are actually signed, or, uh, signed and uh, ratified all these UN conventions. But they want to set up a hybrid court. Still, they are actually blaming the accountability where you have not punished the war cri criminal. Now, actually, Sri Lanka, we have war heroes. We have it, it actually humanitarian operation. In that situation, how can they say, and also very recently, a general became a victim. His visa was cancelled without any natural justice followed. They just believe if someone putting a report, they believe it. And very recently, very sad, this general, right? So why they have cancelled the visa? You have to have a investigation. Without any investigation, if you put that, it is very biased. So USA try to control this as well as we have to act according to their program and procedure. No, UNHRC is a place where homegrown situation, homegrown constitution and homegrown methodology we have to develop. Other countries are supporting us. Also, Professor, very quickly, India's role, will uh, it be crucial this time around as well? How do you see them playing out? 
Mahesh, this is the situation. India always, when a resolution coming against Sri Lanka, UNHRC, they abstain. But they will tell you can't pass a resolution against targeting one country. So, actually India most of the time they look the perspective of USA. On the other side, Russia, China, Cuba, Vietnam and most of the Middle East, uh, Arabic region countries, they are supporting us. So, what they do, always India, South Africa, they, they are in mid. They think this should not be passed, but they are absent. But they should understand one day this will happen to them with the Kashmir situation. So, we have to win India. To win India, we have to do a lot of things via 13th Amendment implementation as well as the reconciliation process we have started. The new government, uh, Minister uh, of Foreign Affairs, Honorable uh, Professor GLP, has visited India and gave most of these uh, pledges. So, I think in future we can win India in such a situation. So, if India abstain, that is a lost situation for Sri Lanka. If we win India, definitely all these resolutions will go to the wastage basket. True, indeed. Thank you very much, Professor Prasiba Mahanamiheva, for joining us uh, on State of the Nation. Let's take a short commission break. When we return, another element on the fight against terrorism takes center stage here in Sri Lanka. Stick around.